research seminar. And my name is Yu Zhang, and I'm associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at USF. And this is the USF Transition Research Seminar. Uh, sorry, if you're not talking, could you please mute yourself so we can, we will not have the echo. Yeah, so this seminar is sponsored by the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, the Center for Urban Research at USF, and also um, the three university transition centers sponsored by USDOT, including the NISA, National Institute um, on, for Congestion Reduction, and the CTEC Center for Transition Environment and Community Health, and also TOMIT. TOMIT is a center using um, the new tricks to do the travel demand modeling. And also it's um, uh, coordinated and assisted by two student chapters. One is the in, uh, Institute of Transition Engineer, ITS, USF student chapter. Another one is the WTS International USF student chapter. And for this seminar, actually is a joint seminar together with another student chapter, which is the Florida Airport Council. Uh, by the way, Hualong, your background is um, flipped. So we can we, we we cannot see the Florida Airport Council, but it's flipped. Really? <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. Um, Okay, so yes, so this is a joint seminar and uh, Hua Long Tang, who's the president of uh, FAC student chapter at USF, actually, you know, um, initiated to invite uh, Mr. Finn Bostad for this seminar. So I will invite Hua Long to officially introduce uh, Mr. Bonstead. And Hua Long, uh, maybe you want to maybe give a very brief introduction of this FAC student chapter and then start to introduce our speaker today. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Zhang. Hi, Finn. How are you doing? Hello, good to see you. Very good, thank, thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, we are the uh, chapter of, uh, student chapter of Florida Airport Council, and we are very happy to invite our speaker today, uh, Mr. Finn Bounceth from uh, VH, uh, VHB. And uh, our chapter uh, is a newly uh, established chapter uh, back in 2019. And now we have uh, a little bit over 20 members in our chapter. And we are uh, FAC for Airport Council. We have, it's a very big organization that uh, have heavy members from uh, industry and uh, from many commercial airports in the Florida. So, uh, if you guys are interested in our student chapter, and uh, feel free to uh, reach out to me. And uh, it's uh, uh, this this event we are very thrilled to have uh, Mr. Bonset here. So let me first introduce him. So Mr. Finn Bonset is the director of aviation services for VHB, and he's an accomplished airport planning development consulting professional with both technical and managing real and the leadership experience spanning 22 years. Mr. Bon Francet, uh, Mr. Finn Bonset has worked on numerous master plan projects on both US and international stages and is well versed with both FAA and ICAO recommended practices, rules and regulations. In the spirit of uh, promoting aviation, Mr. Bonsas enjoys teaching and has held an adjunct professor position at the Florida Institute of Technology, College of Aeronautics for the last 15 years. He also holds a FAA commercial pilot license with instrument rating for both single and multi-engine aircraft. So before we uh, having this seminar, I want to share a, a very interesting uh, experience of mine uh, during the COVID. So, Last semester, I, we were having a project, uh, like a bi-weekly project, and I met a guy on the uh, our bi-weekly meetings through Teams. So I never saw him in person, actually, but until uh, last month, I, I finally saw him in person. And I didn't tell him about this tall. Like, from the camera, I saw him. He was like a, an average height person, but when I saw him in person, he was, wow. I, I didn't know you are this tall. So, you know, a lot of aspects of life has been changed. You know, before the pandemic, probably we, we met a person, especially new people in person first. Then we probably see him or see her 
after online or virtually, probably would never saw him or her online <laughs> in the rest of our life. But because of the pandemic, we started to meet new people virtually first, then we started to meet them in person. So this kind of really changed our perception of a person. Like also, I mean, you guys probably never, you cannot tell actually Mr. Bong said he's really tall. You cannot tell from the camera, he's really tall. I mean, really tall. Like you cannot miss him if he's in the room. So, um, I mean, also like the, uh, pan the pandemic has impacted a lot of like how we plan, how we do the airport master planning. So that's a topic and Mr. Bonsai is going to talk today. So with that being said, uh, let's welcome Mr. Bonsai to give us this presentation. Fantastic. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Hualong, for the introduction, and thank you, uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, you, you as well for the kind words. Uh, indeed, I'm I'm six foot five, Hualong, so yes, I'm I'm a tall guy, but uh, I'm I'm originally from uh, from the Netherlands, so I'm actually considered to be uh, average height. There's a lot more tall people in Holland, believe it or not. So uh, yeah, I, I I blame the uh, the dairy products on that. But uh, anyway, <laughs> no, it's it's an honor and pleasure to be here. And uh, the way that I really want to uh, run this this lecture today um, is is just talk to you about what's happening with uh, with master planning and what master planning for airports means uh, especially during times of covid and uh, what's what's important there is that uh, I, I want to make this interactive if possible so if anybody does have a question on, on one of the, the items that I'm talking about uh, please do raise if you can in teams on the top right of your screen I believe you can uh, raise your hand and I'll try to keep uh, keep an eye on it and I think maybe while long and um, um, and 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 you you can also help with that a little bit uh, so that we all have our speaking turns. But um, so in general, what I'm going to do is I just want to cover you know the typical master planning steps and talk about each one of those master planning steps in terms of how we're seeing things now during times of COVID and what we're really uh, planning for uh, when it comes to future airport development. So starting that off, the, the first thing I want to do is define what is an airport master plan, right? So uh, I'm also a professor at Florida Tech. So when I when I teach my students, there's there's one line, one definition that I typically use, and that is the sponsor's concept for airport development, long term development. Um, so the sponsor being whoever is in charge of that airport, sometimes their authorities, sometimes their counties, sometimes their cities, there's different structures, but it's really their vision. They want they want to go ahead with their airport. They're they're the ones that are sitting or that that are that are on location that know the inside and outs of of the local economy and 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 local politics as well. So we always have to listen to the sponsor. So that's what a master plan is a 20 years of airport uh, infrastructure development planning. So having said that, 20 years is a long time out in the future. Um, and, and typically for an airport, uh, a master plan gets redone just about every five years. Uh, it's supposed to be a living, breathing document. Things do change over time, obviously. Um, airport layout plans, which are part of a master plan, are also updated quite frequently so that the airport can get funding for uh, proposed infrastructure development projects. So in terms of what, what the steps are of a master planning process, and this is where I want to have that conversation and what, what, what I'm seeing as an airport planner in the industry um, are for each one of these steps. And each one of these steps are changing. And typically the way that an airport master plan runs is we typically start with um, goals and objective setting, right? So we talk to the sponsors, we talk to the stakeholders, and we set goals and objectives specifically for that airport. Um, typically after that, we do what's called an inventory process. So basically we take an inventory of every Every single object element from that airport, from the airside components, you know, you're talking runways, taxiways, aprons, uh, bridges, all the way through the terminal components inside the terminal building to the land side component, which is basically your access, your roads, and all of your airport other lands that you may have. Um, so we take a total inventory. What does the airport have at this time? And then we're going to going to try and assess what the airport needs in the future. So what we do after we've we've gathered all of our inventory, all of our elements from the inventory, we do a forecast, right? So that's where we look in our proverbial crystal ball and we try to predict the future. Um, and I'm going to talk about what's changing in forecasting because COVID has obviously thrown uh, quite a, a, a wrench in, in being able to plan for the future. So I want to have a discussion on that. Um, typically after a forecast, once you kind of have a prediction, a direction that you want to go where you think the industry is going to go for your specific airport, uh, we typically get into something called a demand capacity analysis. 
And this is where we, where we assess our current uh, demand versus our current capacity and try to determine where the differences are. Do I need more uh, runways? Do I need more taxiways? Do I need more parking spots for vehicles? All of these things come into play with a demand capacity analysis. A step after the demand capacity analysis after that is the uh, excuse me, uh, facility requirements. So once you know where your gaps are, once you know what you need in the next 5, 10, 20 years, um, then you identify the exact facilities, right? So that's when you would do things such as runway length determinations, sizing for your terminal, how much more square feet do you need, for example, for all the different components I talked about previously. Uh, again, like I said before, I'm going to talk about each one of these steps in a little bit more detail with regards to COVID, but I just want to get you an idea of the typical process that we that we go through. So after we look at the facility requirements, we take a look at what can we do with the airport, with the land, with with uh, with all of our, our infrastructure that we have, and that's called all the alternative section uh, or alternatives chapter. So what we want to do is we want to take a look at, okay, let's see, we need another runway. All right, where can we put it? What's the best location from an environmental perspective, from a, um, a you know, from a, a land availability perspective, uh, from an airspace perspective? That's, that's just one example of it. So you start looking at the best alternatives and you come up with what's called preferred alternatives. Once you have preferred alternatives, then you need a schematic. Uh, so you need to be able to show this on a drawing, um, and that's called the airport layout plan. And again, it's not just one drawing, it's a series of drawings. I don't want to get into too much detail there, um, but the airport layout plan is really what's critical for uh, the FAA to approve so that you can get federal funding for your project. So it must be documented, uh, it must be um, there's there are certain checklists that you need to go over uh, to make sure that you have a FAA compliant and approved ALP so you can get that funding. So typically after the ALP, um, we also have uh, an environmental slash sustainability section in the master plan. Uh, some environmental aspects are actually considered during the alternatives process, uh, but that's also very important. A lot of airports are implementing sustainability strategies related to resilience, you know, things such as waste management, uh, better use of your utilities, et cetera, et cetera. That's an important part as well especially during times of COVID where airports need to be able to save money uh, because airports are losing money right now. So sustainability is a very important component of that. And then uh, last but not least, obviously you also need to be able to look at your funding mechanisms. And uh, one of the things I want to talk about today as well, and again, this is still my introduction, but um, I do want to talk about alternative funding strategies that some airports are implementing in these times of COVID. So that's my idea uh, in terms of just discussing this openly, and I want to run you through those steps, but and what we're seeing that that's very important in these in these strange times. So going back to where I was on that, so um, the first part I've, I've talked about the um, uh, the goals and object, uh, objectives and during the master planning process, the first thing we do, obviously we want to set those objectives, uh, but during times of COVID, airports are looking at prioritizing things a little bit differently. Um, it, 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 in most cases, what we're seeing is that sponsors and airport owners slash operators really want to focus on uh, safety critical projects, right? Um, planning for additional demand in the future now that the COVID recovery might take another two to three years to see pre-COVID levels, um, safety critical projects are still going to be prioritized. So. The good thing is, is that during COVID, there's less passengers, there's less airplanes, there's less operations. Uh, you can actually do these projects a lot faster sometimes because you don't have to hold up passengers and you don't have to schedule certain construction times. So that's a big benefit actually of COVID. You can get projects done um, that usually take a lot more time. And those have come to the forefront of a lot of sponsors and how they uh, start their uh, objectives. So that's the inventory uh, part. One of the things that uh, I, I do want to mention, again, this is the first step um, uh, beyond goals, is going to be creating your inventory. And one of the things that we're coming across a lot um, as airport planners, especially in places like Florida, where we have a very old uh, airport system that dates back to uh, pre-World War II, um, there's a lot of uh, underground um, utilities that are not always documented. So one of the things that we're seeing that I'm seeing uh, recently in in, um, in inventory processes is anal an analysis of what it, what exists at the airport from a utility perspective. And a lot of times they need to do subservice investigations, um, especially if they're going to be doing a larger infrastructure projects that require demolition of pavement or that require demolition of terminals. A lot of airports, basically, believe it or not, don't know what's underneath of their their pavement. 
So these are things that we're seeing and with modern technologies such as subservice and, and, uh, and uh, radar type uh, equipment, we're able to be, we're able to plan for that a lot better and use that as part of our inventory process to really get an airport a good base for, for development. So that's, I mean, that's mostly the inventory. It's not a lot, not a lot of changes with COVID. Uh, it's a pretty standard process or standard part of a master plan. Um, but typically the, the next step is really what's critical. And that is forecasting. Uh, as you can imagine, as I said before, um, you know, e even IATA, the International Air Transport Association, is saying that the COVID recovery going back to pre-COVID levels on passengers and operations will probably take another two years, even three years. That's a long recovery. It's a lot of, that's a long time to not know when those recovery elements are going to happen. So what a lot of airports are doing um, with their consultants, mostly consultants like myself, um, we, we are doing something called scenario based forecasting. So we take a look at certain trigger points, certain passenger levels or operational levels that would trigger a certain type of development. Uh, a lot of airports actually have had to cut back on new runway infrastructure projects or new taxiways. Uh, anything that's not, not necessarily safety critical are now going to be delayed. So you have to plan for that. So when, when, when do you actually start those projects? So from a forecasting perspective, you set trigger points. You say, okay, at, let's say, you know, a million passengers in the next, you know, two years. When we hit that million mark, that's when we start uh, start construction for that. So you can actually do that through both the uh, forecasting process and also in a demand capacity analysis. Now, also, what's important in forecasting, uh, what we're seeing quite a bit of with COVID. <clears throat> is new technologies, right? So new focuses. One of the things that, um, or I, I'm gonna name two that I think are very important and that we're seeing in the master planning process uh, is the advent of UAS or unmanned aerial systems, right? So drones, uh, or what they also call it unmanned aerial vehicles uh, and also cargo. You know, those, those have been two focused areas uh, in the last year and a half since the beginning of COVID that have kind of been raised up a level. Um, it's, it's a good example. I'm, I'm about to start a master plan up, up north and I'm not going to give too much detail because <clears throat> we're still going through the contracting phase, but there's airports that are now actively looking at creating drone facilities, uh, UAS facilities, um, so that companies such as Amazon uh, or companies such as Walmart can actually use airports for that drone delivery. So that actually ties into cargo facilities. So we're seeing a lot of interest. Um, as, as you may know, Amazon has not only invested in distribution facilities close to airports. Um, in our neck of the woods here in Florida, there's a huge one at Lakeland. You can see the impact that has in, in the area there, um, but it's happening all across the country. Uh, significant um, investments either outside of airports or onside of airports, it's coming. So that does present a problem for a lot of airports that may not have the infrastructure to do that. And I'll talk a little bit about that in my facility requirements section here. So that's very important. So cargo and UAS operations are actually being part of um, detailed forecast analyses. And that's that's also driving airports to invest in that section because that's still, even though forecast was slightly down during times of COVID, it's still expected to, to go up. People were, were still ordering items online. Um, so cargo is still very, very important uh, part of airport planning. Um, <clears throat> another big thing that, that we have to consider for forecasting uh, is fleet mix, something called fleet mix, right? Um, it's part of your demand capacity and forecasting analyses. So fleet mix means what, what type of airplanes are going to fly in and out of your airport. And there's been some significant changes in the last year, year and a half. Uh, from the top level, the, high, the bigger airplanes, you may know that a lot of 747s have been retired. Um, I think the last one was built a couple of months ago, so there's no more 747 production except for the, um, the 8F, which is a cargo aircraft. And also the A380 has no longer in production. So you're seeing that these larger airplanes just didn't work very well. And especially now with COVID, there's really not a need for such high seat capacity on airplanes. Uh, so that's a big, big change. So what are we seeing instead? We're seeing companies like Airbus, uh, who have basically mimicked the old Boeing 757 into a, what's called the A321, the Airbus A321, the XLR. So those are the Neo type aircraft that are a single aisle narrow body aircraft that can actually go across the pond. They can fly very long distances because engines and aircraft have become more efficient. So that might be a, a trend. It's going to be a trend where, you know, 
airlines can actually fly those more frequently, even though they're lower seat capacity, but it matches the demand of international travel. So you have to plan for that, especially when you're looking at your fleet mix. Do I need more wide body gates versus narrow body gates? Uh, these are important questions to ask because it makes a big difference in terms of infrastructure development and funding. Other things we're seeing, uh, even at the regional airport level, um, there used to be a really big movement towards um, regional jets with less than, than 50 seats. And, and that is now, that's really changing. What we're, what we're seeing in the industry and what we're used, used for forecasting is airlines have started using A320s, 737s on those routes uh, for maybe less frequent flights, but higher passenger numbers. So even though th those were trends before COVID, I think it's reasonable to expect to see that, that change uh, to continue, uh, especially as you don't see a lot of new 50 seat jets uh, coming, on that, coming out on the market. Um, OK, so I'm going to stop here for just a second. I know I, I, I tend to uh, babble on about things because I'm an absolute aviation nerd and I love this stuff, but I just want to hold on a second and see if anybody has any questions. OK, hearing none, um, I am going to continue a little bit on the um, on the different types of uh, forecast things that we're looking at. A couple of new things in the industry as well, beyond just the UAS cargo and, and these different types of uh, larger and smaller airplanes. But there's also new trends. Um, I read this morning that uh, Breeze Airways, um, that is a new um, a new airline that was started by the, um, the ex-CEO of JetBlue and Azul in Brazil, Dave Nealman. Um, that is a really neat, neat concept because the concept for Breeze is that you can actually reserve a an automobile parking spot at the airport, reserve a spot in line, and then get on the airplane with a reserved seat. So it's a new way of thinking of the of the the passenger check-in process where everything's taken care of, and that's supposed to be a lot more efficient. It's better customer service for the for the passenger. Um, so you've got these new ideas, these new things that are coming that are really going to help, I believe, the aviation industry. Um, also, it's important to consider uh, when we're talking about forecasting and fleet mix, some of the other new initiatives. Uh, I happen to live in Melbourne here on the on the East Coast, Melbourne, Florida. And uh, over here, right in my backyard, they are actually building a supersonic business aircraft. So how will that impact um, uh, our operations? How will that work with things such as sonic booms and, 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 and the popularity of this type of travel? So things are changing in the industry and it's, it's, it's pretty wild. Um, last but not least, I want to just mention uh, for forecasting. <clears throat> typically when as a consultant, when we do a forecast of, of, of demand, right? You do a 5, 10 and then a 20 year forecast. Obviously, the further out you go, the less accurate things are. However, typically, um, if the FA that actually the FA does have to approve a forecast for specific funding, but we want to typically be within 10% of the FAA's terminal area forecast, the TAFs, um, and that that is that is a difficult element, especially um, now with COVID. Uh, the FA I think is right now is working on TAFs still, and TAFs are going to be very low, um, very very low growth trends because of COVID. So what if you what if you work with an airport that is seeing upticks in growth and you still have to be within 10 percent of a TAF. So with a lot of things that we're seeing during times of COVID is we have to work together with the FAA to make sure all the stakeholders, including the FAA, the sponsor, um, anybody else from the airport that we're all in line, not only with the TAF, but what's really happening at an airport. And in our industry, that's always a bit of a battle. So a lot of times, one of the things that we're seeing in the master planning process is the FAA saying, hey, listen, is there any way that you can wait with your master plans so that we can see where the trends are going with, with COVID so that we can adjust our TAFs? Um, so even from an FAA perspective, sometimes it's better to hold off on a master plan so that there's a little bit more certainty with going ahead in the future and predicting operations. So I have to say that, and that's, that's being realistic. Um, I agree with that. Uh, but a lot of airports also have to keep moving on with master plans, and that's why we do scenario based forecasting. OK, so moving on a little bit here, um, <laughs> typically after you do a forecast, uh, we talk about the demand capacity analyses. Um, again, we're, at, we're assessing our, you know, our current capacity at the airport versus the predicted demand from the forecast. At this time in the master planning process, we are still using some older techniques. Um, 
but um, there is new technology that's coming out uh, with regards to being able to assess demand versus capacity based on a lot of uh, system parameters, right? So that means that um, in the future, we should be seeing hopefully some new software from the FAA side that we can use as planners that, that integrate all the, uh, uh, you know the, the the more archaic tables that are out there uh, for understanding you know how many runways or how how, how many uh, hours per uh, operations per hour you can have for certain runways for certain uh, runway systems airport systems uh, right now that's still very um, uh, difficult to do just based on what the what the demand will be but at the same time uh, from a demand capacity perspective sorry just make sure I didn't get a, a question here. Um, at the same time, it's always going to be great to work with the FAA to get those new tools so that we can do these demand capacity assessments and understand where the gaps are. Um, I typically have a rule in airport planning and design that um, <clears throat> if you are close to 60% of your overall capacity, whether it's from a passenger perspective, uh, operations perspective, uh, if you're at 60%, you need to start planning for development and at 80% you need to be in construction. So that's a general golden rule of thumb that I've used. I, I believe it's from the old Horan Jeff books. If anybody else is here, here is a is an airport planner. Uh, but I think that 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 works pretty well. So even in a master plan, we use that 60 80% rule to determine when do we actually start planning? When do we start designing and construction? Obviously very important during times of COVID as well. So the next part, I, I think this is this is, this is a really interesting part, um, and that's the facility requirements. So let's say you've, you've created, you understand where your gaps are in your capacity. You know what your demand is, your predicted demand. Now, what do we start building? What are our actual, actual facility requirements? Um, so there's a couple of important thing, things that have happened in about the last year and a half, especially with, um, uh, with, with COVID. Uh, again, I've mentioned the focus on cargo and UAS. We are seeing that across the board. Um, that's important to consider for facility requirements. But also one of the things that airports are looking for, and if you think about an airport that needs to make money, that needs to have a certain amount of revenues per year, a lot of that is dependent on passengers, right? Passengers going through your airport, paying a passenger facility charge, uh, using the concessions, uh, air, air, airlines, um, uh, being assessed landing fees, all of these different components that we typically depend on are not there anymore. So a lot of airports in the master planning process are looking at what's called non-aeronautical revenue uh, development. And a lot of that is through airport using airport land uh, or available land for commercial interests. Um, so again, that's 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 a big trend. A lot of airports are looking at airport planners to say, okay, what I've got this big piece of land out there. It's it's got great great commercial frontage near a highway. Um, I, I can also use it maybe for uh, aeronautical facility. Um, again, the difference between aeronautical land and non aeronautical is very important, but airports are looking to exploit what they have so that they can get additional revenue streams. So we're seeing a lot of that. And from an airport planning perspective, airports don't just want that two dimensional. Yes, here's here's here you have a two dimensional piece of land. Here's what you can probably do with it. No, from a planning perspective, airports really want to get more into detail. Things such as fair market value assessments, uh, things as understanding what utilities are there. Can we build a distribution center? Uh, does it tie in with roadways properly? What's what's a traffic engineering and what's a traffic uh, planning initiative that could be associated with it? So many different things. Um, now, not all of this may be eligible for funding, but a lot of airports are paying a little bit extra to get a really, really good um, pre-plan so that they can sell that land or use it um, for commercial interest. So that's been a big change. There's been a big shift towards that, especially during COVID. <clears throat> um, a couple of more things on, on that that are important. Uh, some airports are also focusing on, on private aviation. Uh, FBOs, uh, fixed based operators where you know private aircraft can come in and get service. Um, those are still very popular. Uh, the trends there um, are just about the same, I think, as they were pre-COVID, but there are a lot of airports out there that have been focused on that and attracting new business. Uh, same thing for uh, MRO, we call that maintenance repair overhaul. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, airports do have additional land that's available, and that could be very cheap for an airline tenant to perhaps come in and start doing maintenance. We are seeing an increase in that as well. A couple of other things that are important uh, you may have heard about. Um, there's now Section 163. Uh, again, um, these the 
this is uh, from the FAA side, uh, where before the FAA had a lot of um, cloud and approval uh, elements for airports to use non-aeronautical land. Uh, that's been cut back a little bit through Section 163, so that there's less involvement from the FAA allowing airports to make decisions based on um, enhancing that revenue stream. So that that's a good thing. And these things are moving. So even working hand in hand with the FAA and the, and, 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 and the federal, um, our, our federal cohorts, uh, those things are, are working very well. And it gives the airport a little bit more autonomy in terms of what it can do with its available uh, interests. Hi, Finn, uh, may I ask a question? Yes. Please go ahead. So you mentioned aeronautical land and non aeronautical land. So, what are how to define that? Also, when the airport acquired the land, has that been determined already? Is it possible to change? Um, yeah, appreciate if you can give a little bit more background. Yeah, sure, sure. So, so you know, any, any aeronautical land is basically any any land that is that is used for aeronautical pur purposes, right? So, anything that could be related to aviation, um, whether that's for future taxiways, future runways, uh, or future uh, aviation related facilities, uh, such as what I just mentioned, um, uh, MRO or cargo, um, and and non aeronautical is really land that's not associated with the operation of the air of of the airport or airfield. Um, and you know, back in the day, a lot of that, you know, the the land that was transferred, especially here in Florida, it's actually a good example. Um, yeah, I think back in the late '50s, a lot of uh, military land was transferred back uh, to either counties or cities, or in this case, you know, a lot of authorities out there. Um, but yes, the, the the designation of land does require quite a bit of input from FAA, but it can it can be changed if the FAA deems it. Um, appropriate and not safety critical or that it could affect uh, a future capacity of the airport. So you do have to go through quite a process if you want to change it from non aeronautical to aeronautical and vice versa. Uh, th that's very closely monitored by the FAA. Thank you. And, and that's happening and, and to your question, um, Dr. Zhang, it's it's th that's something that's happening quite frequently. Um, as, as airports are trying to, again, enhance those revenue streams, right? So super, super important stuff. Mm -hmm. So I want to go back, back real quick, uh, speaking of, of non-aeronautical. Uh, and I keep mentioning cargo because it is, it, it's it's a hot ticket. I guess. Your voice was breaking, so um, I think the last sentence probably was not heard by the audience. Can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, can you hear me now? I just want to make sure I've got the right connection here. How about other people? I saw a thing is freezing. If yeah. Yeah, he's frozen. Frozen. Okay. Now it's okay. All right. Sorry. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, Again. I think it's still not very good. Uh yeah. Finn, you might want to turn off your video. Can you, can you hear me? Maybe that would ah. <laughs> we cannot hear you now. Oh, okay, he's joined again. Hello? Can, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. OK, I apologize. I have no idea what happened. I was I was thrown out. Um, I can. I apologize. Is, is, is this? Is this better? 
Yeah, Finn, your, your internet connection seems to be limited. You might uh, try turning off your video. Let me... Uh... Uh, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Oh. You, you, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Are you talking now? I cannot hear you now. We cannot hear you. I think now the internet infrastructure is the most important thing <laughs> in many of our lives. All right, so our speaker uh, left the meeting temporary and I think he will join again shortly. Okay, he's coming again. Hello, welcome back. Hello, can you guys hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, okay, I turned everything else off that was running in the background. So is, is this better you? Yes. I, I apologize. I have no idea what happened. My, my internet must have had a, a quick little dive. So my, my, my apologies to all that are on the phone here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, I think where I left off, I, I wanted to talk about cargo a little bit. And, and one of the things, and I keep hitting cargo because um, it's been one of those focus areas um, uh, during COVID. So one of the projects, and I, I can't disclose where or exactly who it is because it's still a confidential project, but just to give you an idea from a facility requirements perspective and master planning, imagine if you have an airport that is encroached upon by the city. Let's say you're in the middle of a big city. All right, take, take again, I can't give uh, too much information, but take a city like Miami, for example. You have an airport there, Miami International Airport, on all sides, um, basically, you are encroached upon by the city, by, by, by infrastructure. Same thing, if you look at that airport, every single piece of land on that airport has been used. Uh, and it's really going to be difficult if they want to buy land in the future. It's going to cost a lot of money. Everything is, is, is surrounded by uh, industry and the industrial areas. So what can you do if you want to enhance cargo, right? That's one of your, your, your main attractants. Uh, it's a trend that, that keeps going up. So what can you do? Well, the best thing to do is to consolidate and try to get uh, one facility on one side of the airport and think vertical. So what we're seeing is a trend towards potential vertical cargo facilities that are highly mechanized or automated. Uh, something akin, if, 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 any of, if any of you out there are fellow aviation nerds like me, um, Hong Kong uh, is a very good example. That was one of the first mechanized automated facilities where they had vertical cargo storage. So those are some of the initiatives that large airports are, are looking at that don't have a lot of land um, that are going towards that, that vertical idea so that they can put cargo in one area and free up other space around an airport that can be used for other revenue enhancement type uh, initiatives. Now, the question is, how do you do that? And one of the one of the ways to do that is is look for outside interest, right? I was I'm going to talk about financing later, but there are there is a lot of interest from international joint ventures uh, that are looking to invest, uh, especially in the United States, for long term uh, type contracts or concessions where there's some profit sharing. You know, these are 30 to 50 year long concessions where basically an outside source comes in, builds the facilities, runs it for 30 to 50 years, makes their money, makes a return on investment, probably after a very long time. Um, and then it goes back to the airport and the airport also still gets profit sharing. Uh, 
So these types of initiatives are trends that we're seeing. And from a master planning perspective, we have to take that into account. So we can actually think outside the box. We can not only think in 2D small, you know, like one level cargo facilities. Let's think vertical. Let, let's go vertical if we can. Um, and of course, you have to be very careful with part 77 and object clearance as well. So those are those are some very interesting trends that that, for example, we as a company are looking at as well. Uh, one thing I will say as well, uh, when it comes to um, facility requirements, uh, there's a lot of things that are changing from a design perspective. Uh, for those of you on the call that that deal with some of this, I typically call this our, our aviation planning Bible or airport design Bible, and that's the uh, the AC 150-5300-13A where there's a new version coming out, which, which is thir uh, 13B, that changes a lot of those design parameters. So things have changed when it comes to spacing between things such as air aircraft wingtips and objects, uh, apron design, taxiway design, uh, the way that we do instrumentation, uh, safety clearances, protective services. <clears throat> All those things are actually changing as we speak. Uh, the FAA is still soliciting input on those type of advisory circulars. So as planners, and especially now in the times of COVID, we want to try to save as much money as we can for airports. So the better the design, the better upfront th thinking we have, and the better we can uh, streamline our design requirements, the better it is for the overall industry uh, in terms of safety and, and revenue savings or cost savings. Um, so those things are very important. Uh, the next thing, and I think um, I've talked about facility choir requirements quite a bit, um, but typically after that, as I've said before, we look at alternatives development. That's pretty much the same same process where we, we select preferred alternatives based on where you can put certain elements or what the best fit is for a specific uh, infrastructure development project. But then the next step would be to put all those preferred uh, alternatives into what's called an airport layout plan, uh, the good old ALP. And again, as I said before, an ALP is really a requirement that needs to be have a stamp of approval from the FAA and that allows you to get the funding for your projects. Without it, you're not going to get federal funding. So that's very important. And the one thing I want to highlight here when it comes to COVID and when it comes to saving airports money and time in the future <clears throat> is the debate of whether or not an ALP should be digital in a digital format or in a paper format. Um, now, in this day and age, um, there is something, there, there has been uh, pilot programs from the FAA side with certain airports. That's called an electronic layout plan, an EALP, sometimes called an IALP for intelligent ALP. Some, some companies do it differently. But the idea is, is to have your airport layout plan in a GIS type uh, base, right? So you're, do, you're, you're mixing CAD with GIS. But the good thing about GIS, it allows you to actually update things a lot easier uh, and control, can control certain elements as well. Um, GIS ties into pavement management programs. You can click on a certain section, know exactly how old that pavement is, when it was last treated or, or, or maintained, what type of pavement, when it was built. All this information, big data, is now something that we can incorporate into airport layout plans. Now, the work up front is a lot more intense. It does cost a little bit more, but in the long run, because it's now a digital type of program or a digital format, you can update things a lot easier. Uh, let's say, for example, if you want to change from a non-precision approach to a precision approach, the data is there. You'd have to update, the, of course, the services, the TERPs that go along with it, but at least you have a, the base data of where everything's located. Um, based on the latest surveys. So that really makes an airport layout plan a livable, uh, a breathable <laughs> or, or usable document. Um, and that's important. You know, we're seeing a lot of airports that are more progressive push for this. Yes, it's more expensive. Yes, there are some inconsistencies with what's fundable under the AIP handbook or not. Um, but I personally believe that's the way to go. Um, the good thing is, um, a lot of this data acquisition used to be quite expensive, but now uh, we use drones um, to to get imagery for airports right we can we can we can do lidar uh, we can you know we can get a lot, lot easier as built type information that can be put into an airport layout plan so from that perspective using this new technology to actually mine the data get the data for an airport layout plan that's also a trend that we're seeing more and more of and it's actually cheaper to do that instead of having to pay for somebody to fly um, when the weather's good, you can actually just get somebody with a drone, with a good drone, a, a lighter type drone, and get the same information. So we're looking, airports are looking for, for, for new ways to save those costs up front, um, and that's one way to do it. 
Uh, any 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 other questions? I want to stop here for a second. It's already twelve forty five. But any any other, any other questions on on what I've talked about so far? Okay, so far so good. Okay. Um, so talking a little bit about some other elements that that are that are quite important. Um, the next typical section okay. after the ALP. Oh yeah, go ahead. I saw it's a Jorge. Yes, Jorge. How are you? Yes, Jorge. Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm very familiar uh, with the Amazon. Uh, I live in Lakeland. Yeah. Between between the Barto Airport and the uh, Lakeland Airport. So for many years, I never heard a aircraft uh, speak as a 747 flying over my roof mm -hmm. until they opened this. Uh, what kind of ordinance and how close is the this plan that you are talking about? working with the MPOs or the local municipality. I know they require federal approval, but how close do they work with the locals? I'm sure they do transportation, POs, uh, planning organizations, and uh, and the ordinance, the noise control and things like that. I'm in few minutes, probably run, once the meeting is over, I know that Amazon aircraft would fly over my roof is daily. Uh, I never heard that before going over the neighborhood. OK, very, very good question and a very good concern. Um, so 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 first, yes, so so the increase in airplanes, you know, that, that that's a trend. If uh, the latest and greatest on Amazon, they, they just started buying their own airplanes instead of leasing them, right? So for them, that means it's, in my opinion, is a very long term investment. Um, and places like Lakeland, where you do see that increased activity, uh, even beforehand, as part of the master planning process, and sometimes separate from it, um, there should have been, and, and there was, a, a what, what's called typically a Part 150 study or a noise study related to an increase in noise for those type of new aircraft for Amazon. And in order to even get that approved, you are working, uh, you have to have workshops, public workshop, public involvement processes, um, uh, it, it's it's all that's all scrutinized from a public point of view. Now, what what they typically do as part of that Jorge is is they do what's called uh, noise contour mapping, right? So what they look for is a uh, a DNL, right? So it's a a day night uh, average sound level that they that they do based on all the operations. So it's not only the Amazon operations, but they take into account every single operation for uh, a year at a time, uh, and they they come up with what's called a 65 DNL and that's kind of a it's a decibel level that's been weighted and, and averaged uh, with a 10 decibel increase at night. Um, so what that does, it shows you a contour map that the, the result of that is a contour map that shows where that 65 uh, DNL line is and anything that's inside that uh, that line must a be mitigated or is is is, is not allowed just from a residential perspective. So. It, it does you, you do get a lot of operations and and you know you do hear those operations but they must keep within that average uh, sound level so that 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 should that that was done before anything I, I'm, I'm absolutely sure I didn't work on the project but uh, for, for Lakeland I am sure that was enacted uh, and that and the public uh, also had a say in that so yes I mean yeah. uh, and, and a lot, you know and, and again it's one of those things where a lot of people they do get annoyed by that one uh, one operation, but from a a a, a law point of view, from a, a technical point of view, um, those those are the regulations associated it's, with that. It's another thing. I don't know if it, one of the local school or uh, state colleges are also merging because of what you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. All the lack of funding before uh, after COVID, the nineteen, uh, they're thinking about doing some sort of training or merging universities and do training pilots or drone pilots or uh, mechanics uh, with local colleges. And I see not only the Amazon blue uh, aircraft, but some planes flying around the neighborhood because the training between Barto and uh, Lakeland Airport now. So yes, yes, I mean, uh, over my neighborhood. 
Yeah, and Jorge, you might have seen an increase there uh, because tra training was, and again, I, I, I teach at Florida Tech as well, and we have a, a good flight training facility there. And, um, and it, Lakeland is one of the more popular destinations to go and, and practice a little bit. Um, but during COVID, the last year and a half, um, a lot of flight schools stopped training just because of the spread of COVID and two people being in a cockpit. I mean, you can imagine some of the impacts there, but it's just starting up again. So you may feel that increase in the amount of training flights a little bit again. Um, but it may also have to do with some of the routing, right? So if there's more larger airplanes coming in using a certain runway, especially at Lakeland, uh, they may have changed some of those, you know, uh, you know, touch and go routes or, or, or whatever it may be. Uh, that might that might be one of the reasons, but uh, I am not 100 percent sure. But thank you. There's a lot of uh, going over the planning of an airport. Oh. Oh, yes, there is. There, there, there's a lot. And, you know, again, one of the things that I was actually going to talk about just now is is that public component. So every, every master plan, um, every approved master plan and every approved process, something the FAA also gets involved with, is that public, uh, what we call a public uh, involvement program, a PIP. Um, so typically what happens with a master plan, they set up what's called a technical advisory committee that's with stakeholders from around the airport that can have an input in the master plan itself and then also a public advisory committee where probably five or six times during a master plan with, with let's say an average of one to two years to do a master plan there's between five and six meetings sometimes more depending on the airport where uh, for each major milestone for the master plan there is a public meeting where consultants like myself and the airport explain the latest and greatest on planning and solicit input from the public so if there's things such what you were talking about, Jorge, with noise concerns, things like that, they will be registered and addressed um, and they must be addressed. It's part of the whole process, but that planning starts a long time before before development happens. So so very good questions. Uh, again, these are hot topics. You know, it's it's always a balance at airports. Noise is one of the biggest part of of master planning and planning in general for an airport, especially when it comes to enhanced uh, infrastructure development. So the one one last thing here, and I think we have about eight minutes left. I, I just want to address as well, and then I'll open it up for some questions here at the end. Um, and I'll just do two or three minutes because I want to make sure I got I got all everybody's questions in here. Um, but last but not least, there's two elements, and one of those is environmental sustainability. That noise component actually falls under the environmental portion of a master plan. Um, but also we talk about sustainability and resiliency, and that that's. That's very big in the airport world. It, there is differences between airports. Some airports are not, are not as focused on it as opposed to others, but uh, there is more of a push also from the federal side to make sure that there are sustainability measures, uh, things such as waste management at an airport, um, things such as resiliency, especially for the coastal areas. You look at like at Fort Lauderdale, they have to plan for sea rise. Um, again, those, those things are part of the planning process. And, and even during times of COVID, Anytime an airport can save money in the long term by being more sustainable, there that's an important component. So we're seeing a push for that on the airport master planning side. And then I'll, I'll cover this real quickly. Um, the last part is that financing component, and I already hinted to that a, a little bit here. But one of the things that we're seeing um, in terms of other options for airports right now, airports obviously don't have a lot of money because they're not getting the income from the passengers. Uh, they are getting things from the CARES Act type initiatives. There's another one coming for airports, a bailout package. Those are great, but those are mostly to cover operational expenses uh, and not necessarily all infrastructure development projects. Certain ones, absolutely safety critical capacity critical um, but there's also a, you know it's, it's very difficult sometimes if an airport has a lot of land and availability for the airport to finance it themselves so airports are looking at um, public private partnership initiatives uh, that that's a big deal right now in our industry um, there are actually believe it or not there's a lot of joint uh, venture type firms international firms that are now starting to compete uh, for American airport uh, type facilities and infrastructure development a good example, um, for example, I'm, I'm from Holland. Schiphol Group now runs, I believe, about eight or nine different airports around the world. So they have management contracts, concession contracts. There's a big Brazilian firm uh, that runs another eight or nine or ten of them. Uh, Vinci Groups is another. It's a French, uh, French Spanish firm that has 47 airports on their uh, on their portfolio. So now we're seeing these larger airport conglomerate groups that have a lot of money, a lot of backing 
um, that are now interested in investing in U.S. airports. So for airport operators from a master planning perspective as well, there's some opportunity there for airports to develop that infrastructure through other sources and means. I mean, it does mean they have to give a little bit of control of their of, of their field and uh, areas, but it's something that can be considered. So that's a lot of talking, but that's that's all the master planning steps. And with COVID, honestly, what we're seeing is we want to make sure that these steps really align and that we have we have options for air, for our airport clients. And that's really what's critical here. If anything from today, and I'll open it up to here in a second, we have about five more minutes left. If anything, uh, COVID has really allowed us to take a, a step back and see what we can do better in master planning and how we can help airports you know, really focus on development, but what's a little bit more exact than, than just, you know, pie in the sky stuff. We want to be a little bit more exact in terms of what can we plan and what can we plan, what's reasonable and what's not, and that's what's critical. So I think, uh, <laughs> Dr. Zhang, on, on, on this one, I will end on that note and just give another four to five minutes. Um, it's a lot of talking, but I really enjoy the question from Jorge, and I'm open to anything else. Thank you so much. It's good that we can see some positive side of the COVID. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and yeah, we do have, um, uh, please go ahead, Joe, please go ahead to raise your question. Thanks, Dr. Zhang. Uh, hi, Finn. Uh, I was wondering if, if you've yep. seen in any master plans yet um, any accommodation of urban air mobility or passenger carrying vertical takeoff vehicles? That's a great question. And you know what? In all my notes, because unfortunately I had some internet problems, I skipped over that a little bit. <laughs> um, but but yes, UAM is huge. And but here's the thing. We're not seeing it so much as part of a master planning process because there's still a lot of uncertainty how, how that would work with airports. The only things I've seen from a larger perspective when it comes to master plans is um, how it ties into autonomous vehicles of the future. So let's say that there's less park, you know, people are gonna need less parking spots, less parking infrastructure. What do you do with those big parking buildings? So there's been a lot of talk about using those facilities, those buildings to have a UAM operation. Um, so that would work if there's other, you know, um, urban air mobility centers off-site, off outside the airport, uh, to use those old parking lots for that specific back and forth. Uh, as a matter of fact, my company VHB, we're working on a smart cities component, and the electric uh, takeoff, um, uh, short short takeoff and landing type vehicles are absolutely being invested in. It's the biggest trend. Um, there's one that's being built near Orlando Airport, and it's there's a lot of coordination that needs to happen with Orlando from an airspace perspective, even with Miami, if they're going to go back and forth, uh, if they're outside of the airport, how do they get to the airport? It's not, and, and I'm just being honest about this, it's not really being looked at as, as a master plan component for airports because those facilities are typically just outside of an airport. But at one point when, you know, when these things start becoming operational, that needs to be considered. So you're, it's it's a great question. I would say that I, you know, if, if I'm going to do the next master plan, I, I would definitely consider that for airports because it's another revenue opportunity. Um, yeah. But it's 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 being looked at from several points of view. Yeah, to add on that, actually, you know, as using Tampa International Airport as a case study, we did look into potential uh, on airport or near airport UAM vertiports. And you know, you, we we have to design some certain procedures so that the the uh, EV tours can land and take off without interfere with existing commercial flights. And um, we also need to have you know the touch touch and go kind of operations require a lot of the space. So yes, it's critical to to identify the procedures that the UAM can use near or at the airport. And, Correct. Um, yeah, but if we can ha have a you know, dynamic collaborative decision making platform, uh, I think the procedure can dynamically change according to the commercial flights uh, usage of the airport capacity configurations, et cetera. So it's possible to be done, but it needs a lot of, uh, you know, uh, integration of the different entities and also maybe automation tools to help achieve that. And you're absolutely right. And and right now, it's also a, cert a question for certification. I think a lot of airports are waiting for for that um, that regulatory landscape to be um, to be resolved. I know the FAA is working on it. NASA is working on it, uh, especially here on, on the East Coast. So I think that's a very good point. Uh, you on that one. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I remember in the in the statewide um, continuous development, continuous CFAPs, CFAPs or CFAPs, you know, the meeting, you probably have attended that too. Um, that was like a three or four years ago. And some airports, like the secondary airport, the small tier airports the, facing the financial problem. Then I said, hey, consider the drone, you know, just to become like a drone specific airport that could be potential markets, right? Yeah. And also the urban air mobility, you know, they can become, uh, there's a market there, so. There is. Yeah, okay. Um, any other questions from our audience? How, how about if, if the, the vertiports uh, is it okay now? Yeah, can you state yeah. your question? Yeah, yeah. How about for those vertiports? They are outside the perimeter of the airports. So who is going to do the like master planning for them? Do you think? No? You cannot hear me? Well, yeah, can you say that last part one more time? I'm sorry, hold on. I, I didn't, I didn't okay, get the question. I, I, got, I got the question. I can help. Okay. Paul. Paul was asking if the vertiport locations is outside of the airport's land, would that be included in the airport master plan or not? Uh, it's it's a good question. Um, I mean, typically you do a master plan based on, on on what's inside airport property, but you have to coordinate with what's outside as well. So, you know, you're looking at overall effects. Um, you know, it's the same thing. If there's if there's an Amazon distribution facility that's that's two miles, three miles out of your airport, is it going to have effect on your you know, your traffic? On on do they want to fly drones out of the airport back and forth? Do they want to have that link while on, for example? Um, yeah, it's 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 part of. I mean, you're you're still addressing it um, as part of the overall plan. And, and you know, to I think uh, a gentleman had asked earlier, it was Jorge. So MPOs, uh, you know, we do coordinate with comprehensive type planning, uh, with system planning. A good master planner really needs to make sure it, it um, they understand what's what's surrounding and how that affects the inside of the airport. Mm -hmm. And Joe, by the way, I saw your hands are still raised. Do you have follow up question? No, sorry. I'll, there, I lowered my hand. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Joe, I, I appreciate your question, by the way. That was a good question. Yeah, I do have a question for uh, Finn. So you mentioned the COVID-19. We know that like uh, the 9-11 uh, event actually affected the security check totally. Yes. Right? And then it's, um, we have seen the changes. So for the COVID-19, from your point of view, I know you have to attend a lot of workshops and in you know, a meeting with airports such. Do you think that will lead to long-term change to the airports and will also add, add additional kind of a, a needs or cost into the master planning? So it's 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 a it's it's a bigger question, I think. And you know, from what I've seen, I'm I'm seeing projects now, for example, that are um, I'm working on two terminal projects that are going to open it up in the next two to three years. And the distancing part is not being considered. There's, it's almost an assumption that there is a certain component where you can have distancing, but that that will eventually become less. It's it's more focus on the equipment itself, right? So what we're seeing is faster processing times, um, e even if we have to handle certain social distancing situations. Um, but what what COVID has really done has pushed the technology further for faster processing rates, but also cleaner, right? So I, I think one of the long-term effects are going to be um, making sure that that there's there, that there's um, uh, what do you call it uh, cleaning equipment. You know, we're talking things such as um, you know ba baggage spraying, ba you know um, um, uh, UV lighting, for example. Um, you know, be better processes for processing processing passengers. The touchless thing, uh, the yes. touchless journey is huge. Compactless yes. process for going Correct. through the inner building, right? Correct, but that's everything. That's from concessions, right? I, I, now, I, th I think people are going to always have a long-term kind of a um, a fear of, of of going to airports and 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 germs in general. I think, I, and that's a big impact. So the technology is now is really being pushed for a more touchless journey, and I think that's the biggest impact. Mm -hmm. How about HVAC? Yeah, H HVAC uh, quite similar. You know, I I, I think with with HVAC um, uh, again when it comes to sustainability resiliency, um, you know, I I think that's important. I think anytime you can you can have cost savings and um, and I apologize for the signs in the background, <laughs> uh, but any times that you can have a more sustainable system, um, you know, that that's that's important for for saving money for airports. Uh, a follow-up question, Finn, if I can, uh, if I may, is that 
you know, 9-11 also caused kind of um, the lo lo losing of money of the, the financial financial crisis of the airlines and then caused the mergers and acquisitions. And with the mergers and acquisitions, actually, the airlines will change their network. For example, reduce the number of the hub airports when they have yeah. more than enough. So do you see that for this COVID-19, because airlines are hit even more severe, severer than 9-11. Uh, so I think they are facing a financial crisis now as well. So probably we'll see more mergers, acquisition changes, dynamics in the airlines. So do the airport master planning also take that into consideration? Yes, yes. That So that's part of that forecasting process normally, right? So you do look at, hey, what happens, potential mergers. So uh, with a forecast, you typically have maybe six or eight different trend lines. And one of those trend lines could be a merger. Actually, when uh, American and, and U.S. Airways got together, we did something very similar where we predicted that merger. Some, some master plans where that merger was right around the corner. We had a trend for that. What happens if this happens? Do we increase flights? Do we get more? Is there more hubbing, less hubbing? Um, so you you can use that, but it's it's another scenario that should could be a trigger point for future planning of an airport. Um, but but that's that, there's there's absolute truth to that. It it could happen. Um, one one trend we are seeing is we're actually seeing a bit of an uptick in regional airports as opposed to people going to hub airports because mm -hmm. the idea is people there's less people in at giant hub airports, so mm -hmm. people are actually traveling further away to go to a smaller airport to travel. Uh, mm -hmm. It's 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 a it's a psychological thing, but that that trend is an actual trend that's been proven for for many of my clients, which is which is really unusual. I don't know if that's going to stay, um, but it does decrease the activities at your larger hub airports. I see. Great. Okay. Uh, any other questions from audience? Okay. I know Finn is super busy, and I. Oh, this, this is fine. I enjoyed this. Your time, and I don't want you to hold it longer. But I, I just want to thank you again, and I really appreciate you spend the time, you know, to deliver this informa uh, informative presentation. Thank you so much to bring the knowledges to our students. So yeah, absolutely. This this was an absolute pr pleasure. I'm sorry I, I cut off for about five minutes. That was I don't know what happened with the internet, but uh, okay. you know I, I I usually like doing fancy slides and things, but there's so much to talk about, and hopefully this was a little bit more interactive, and, and I really enjoyed it. Hopefully everybody got something out of it. I appreciate the great questions, and thank you for having me. It's it's been an honor. I enjoy doing this, so uh, thank you, thank you to everybody. All right, thank you so much, Finn, and thank you everybody.